be our superstar of the day. So, Aiden. So, before we get started, I'd like to announce to everyone that this uh, session, this presentation is being recorded and uh, it will be made available to everyone, either if you're present right now today and get to see it live, or if you'd like to watch it later again or share it with your team or other members who should really see this event. And also the PowerPoint deck will also be made available and it'll be shared out hopefully uh, later this week. And also I just wanted to add one more part is that uh, right now, uh, you may have already attended uh, an event by Aiden, uh, a presentation called Infrastructure as Code Using Terraform. That was the introduction on Wednesday, May 27th. And the one you're looking at or being a part of right now, as you see from the PowerPoint deck of Visible, it, this is the intermediate edition. And then um, as part of this trilogy being presented by Aiden Ermi on Terraform and Azure, the advanced edition, which is very exciting, is next week, Wednesday, at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, so one hour later than today. It'll be one hour later, uh, the next one a week from now, and then that will be the end for the Azure group for the season, and we'll start up again in September. So, um, um, Ezekiel, would you like to continue on with the PowerPoint uh, deck parts of it? Uh, now that I've made sure. that little clarification for everyone, and then you can just talk on, and then I'll jump in when you're ready. Yeah, so you've introduced yourself, Arlan, already, uh, I believe, or, or I, I don't I know if you want to take a minute I, to do Sure. My name is Arlan Nogueira. I specialize in Azure and I'm an Azure subject matter expert. I've had a chance to work with Ezekiel and uh, I'm a big fan of Aiden and I've known him for quite a while now. And um, he's the person I go to when I'm stuck with Azure problems. So <laughs> he is the the resource that is um, either he knows no. the answers or knows where to find the answers. <laughs> no, no pressure. Thanks, Arlen. <laughs> that's right. So um, that's my uh, name and my role right now. And uh, Ezekiel already presented himself. And uh, Aiden, uh, you'll be doing your introduction as part of your uh, presentation. But um, did you want to talk a little bit about your role in the Azure group? Uh, sure, like uh, like Ezekiel, I've been involved with it uh, for many years. Uh, Ezekiel and I go way back, uh, multiple multiple uh, employers ago, um, when we started to kind of participate and uh, and help with this program, and then uh, moving on to like uh, organizing it and scheduling speakers and arranging this. So uh, it's nice to be able to have this uh, forum to like uh, Ezekiel said, share information, share knowledge um, that we all have because we all have different uh, experiences that we can learn from each other. Great intro, uh, Aiden. So I'm going to continue on with this slide deck. It'll just be about another minute or two and then we'll get into the presentation. Um, Ezekiel, did you want to talk about our sponsors for this event? Um, sure, yeah. So uh, uh, as as Aiden mentioned, uh, you know these these kind of events take uh, quite a bit of organizing, and obviously we have uh, we have two organizations behind us that provide us a little bit of uh, support for us to keep going. So thank you, Microsoft, and also Vnext IQ and Microsoft Gold Partner. So thanks uh, uh, to those organizations for keeping uh, the helping us keep this uh, group going. Did you want to continue I'll, on, Ezekiel? Sure, I'll, I'll do these slides and then you take it. I, so sure. I, I, we also wanted to recognize uh, the difficult times that we are all living all over the world. So interesting 2020 for, for everyone around the world. So we just want to recognize and, uh, uh, you know, what, what everyone is experiencing. So we all have a social responsibility to to practice uh, social distance, to be to abide to the guidelines of our local government. So, uh, you know, as much as possible, stay home, stay safe, and stay positive because we'll, there is a light at the end, uh, at the other end of the tunnel. So, great, thank you, Ezekiel. So, yeah. for anyone that is just joining us right now, I just want to mention a few points again. One is that this event is being recorded. If that's of concern. Um, like I said, this is also being recorded and will be released later. If uh, you'd like to watch it offline at some point, the presentation will be made available as well. And that this is the second of three part series on Terraform and Azure being presented by Aiden Nurmi. And the last one is next week. So if you're just joining us, there's a quick catch up on where we are. We'll be finished this introduction uh, slides 
in about a minute, and then we'll get on to the featured event, which is um, Aiden Ermey's presentation on Terraform and Azure, the Intermediate Edition. So one thing that I think is very important to stress is that uh, you won't learn about Terraform or Azure or just about anything else by just listening even to great presentations like this. I'm hoping that you get excited by the content and the ideas, but you need to go off and learn further, including access to the proper resources to actually try these ideas in your own Azure sandbox, your own Azure environment where you could learn and apply these ideas. So there's a lot of free resources available. One is that, uh, which is a great resource, is the learn.microsoft.com, which is what you're looking at on the slide deck right now. That has a, a lots of fantastic resources, not just on Azure, but on all different types of uh, technical resources and areas that Microsoft um, has as part of its services and product line. So please check that out. Lots of great content out there. If you're on a limited budget or any difficulties, this is a great place to start. Uh, the next thing is that um, they do have an Azure learning path. They do have other areas as well, but this is a great place to start if you'd like to know more about Azure. If you're coming in from uh, AWS or a Google Cloud Platform and you decided that you've seen the light and you want to start working with Azure, uh, this is a great place to start to understand how to use your skills that you've acquired on other clouds and to uh, get an introduction to Azure and its terminology and how to find things. Uh, the next thing that key to keep in mind is that you May, if you're on a limited budget or don't want to spend too much money right now, especially at the learning stage, you will find that um, Microsoft has um, about $200 US or $260 Canadian available for a free trial subscription. Uh, you don't need to use a credit card to get those services. And if you use it carefully, you probably can get easily a month out of um, a lot of different services um, that are available on Azure to use as part of your learning or even your certification process. And uh, some other resources for consideration is the one at edX.com. Again, a great set of resources, not just on Microsoft technology and Azure, but uh, lots of other areas that are not just technical programs. So please check that out. And uh, we have now crossed, uh, the Azure group has now crossed the 1,500 membership, and we're now sitting at 1,585 members. So a lot of that has been due to uh, Aiden's um, draw on the Terraform subjects. It has brought a lots of new members from all around the world, which is very exciting. So our new goal is to now hit 2,000, and our strategy is to get to Aiden to present as many times as possible. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's aware of it, but I just thought I'd spring it on him on this call right now. So. Aiden, what do you think of that idea? Uh, on mute, you can hear me, right? I can hear you. Yep, uh, I can present as many times as you want, as long as I have <laughs> something interesting to talk about. Sure, so thank you for taking part in this trilogy on Terraform and Azure, the three different levels. And uh, so everyone, we're looking to reach 2,000 members, so tell your friends and colleagues and uh, tell them what a great event and great speakers we have here and point them to the recordings that we'll share out uh, later this week and you'll be able to see the other recordings available from other great speakers and sessions and um, and also don't forget to follow us on linkedin the azure group.org slash linkedin or the linkedin page itself and you'll find it very easy to do a search and find the azure group on there and that is the end of the introduction to the group and what we do and why we do it. So Aiden, I'm gonna pass it over to you if you wanna take over the screen uh, share and uh, we'll get started. Sure, let me uh, make sure that is going to work. If I can get this up, let me minimize that. If you can just confirm you can see the uh, uh, presentation. I can see it, it looks great. <clears throat> Perfect. OK, and just a bit of a, a quick note to everyone that's on the line. Uh, I am unfortunately working on a single monitor today, so I cannot see the chat uh, or anyone raising their hands. So if there is questions, uh, Arlen and Ezekiel try to field those for me uh, and interrupt me uh, where appropriate or do do feel free to possibly come off mute. Um, or we can kind of leave some time, of course, at the end uh, for additional questions uh, if we don't get those answered. So just thanks. To, thanks for that, that clarification, Aiden. And I will keep an eye out for some messages and interrupt at appropriate times. And um, otherwise, I'll try to let you speak and present accordingly. And and again, as you said, people can come off mute and ask questions. Um, and also, we have time at the end uh, for questions, which is a great time to 
uh, ask your tough questions on Terraform and Azure of Aiden and put him on the spot then and, um, you know, get some answers too. So that's so, it. <laughs> <laughs> so much pressure. <laughs> okay, Aiden, I will leave okay. it with you now. <clears throat> All right, so let's kind of get started. Um, I would say by show of hands, but I can't see the, the chat or anything, but I do recognize some some names in the list that were was able to join uh, this evening from the first session. So this is, as it was mentioned, uh, the second of a three part series on infrastructure as code using Terraform. This is the intermediate one. The, we do have a recording of the um, of the first beginner edition with the uh, the basics of the language and so forth. So we're not going to cover too much on that. Just a little bit. My name is Aiden Ermey. I work for Microsoft as a cloud solution architect, specializing in mostly Azure infrastructure, and part of that is infrastructure as code in ARM and uh, Terraform. <clears throat> so this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to first cover very briefly some quick basics just to kind of level set again. Uh, I'm not sure where everyone is on on the line where they're at in their experience with Terraform, but we're going to assume some pre knowledge or experience with some of those basics uh, and then we're going to get into the intermediate concepts that now that you have experience with Terraform, now we're going to say how do we start to kind of use it more more real world in a more reusable or repeatable way with things like modules. Eventually we want to kind of iterate even further down that path into uh, DevOps. So we're going to uh, touch lightly on DevOps, but the advanced version of this presentation, which is scheduled for next week, I put the link in the chat. The advanced version is the full on end to end DevOps uh, version, so do feel free to uh, register and join us next week for the, the more advanced end to end piece of that. And then we're also going to share some uh, resources with everyone. For those that were able to join the beginner edition, uh, these resources are not just a copy paste, a rehash or repeat of the resources that we shared in the beginner edition of the presentation. These are specifically selected at the intermediate level that are applicable to the concepts uh, and feature sets that we're talking about today. So first we want to kind of share with everyone because this question comes up uh, quite a lot on why should I bother using Terraform? Uh, you know, it, does Microsoft care about Terraform? Uh, because technically it's kind of like a competitor, if you will, if you compare it with like ARM templating and so forth. But we want to really stress to everyone that Microsoft is invested in Terraform. We have, for those that don't know, we have a dedicated team at Microsoft specifically targeted for Terraform. Obviously Terraform on Azure in this context. And HashiCorp has, of course, their team of, of people on Terraform because that's their product, that's what they wrote. And these teams actually work very closely together as they are, are working on the enhancements, <clears throat> excuse me, the refinements in the language and so forth. So something that might not be apparent or, or uh, people might not be aware about is the Azure RM provider. So this is the Terraform provider specific to Azure. That is actually Microsoft's responsibility. We are responsible to update that, enhance that, improve that, bug fix that, not HashiCorp. We're using Terraform because it's HashiCorp's language we're targeting, but we are responsible to produce the, uh, the updates to that provider. So if there's an issue, um, a lot of people just go to HashiCorp and say, hey, this isn't working, and they'll redirect you to the appropriate provider or, or person that's responsible, in this case, Microsoft. <clears throat> so to, to prove how much Microsoft is invested and loves Terraform, uh, the latest release is .17, Right, so it's been uh, released uh, just last week or so. In this release alone, there's been, excuse me one sec. There's been 29 enhancements and bug fixes in that release alone. And if you look at the, at the release path, we've actually released four times the amount of updates and releases in June alone. So effectively, 
pretty much every week we are releasing a, an enhancement or improvement to the provider. So we're absolutely invested uh, and uh, involved with the advancement of Terraform. And our goal is to have Terraform uh, at the level of ARM in the context of <clears throat> what we call like a first class citizen. So we are committed to having Terraform to be on par with what you can do in ARM natively in Azure. It's not 100% there yet, uh, but uh, that is what we are striving to do. Um, I was hear a little bit of background noise, so if uh, Arlen or Ezekiel could uh, mute anyone that's not talking or that doesn't have a question, appreciate that. <clears throat> also, with the Terraform module registry, this is a public registry hosted by HashiCorp, and we as Microsoft actually contribute directly to that repository. So when there's modules in there for, say, creating a VNet, creating some uh, some type of service or some technology in Azure, those are cared for and released by Microsoft as their commitment and uh, community contributions to the advancement and use of Terraform in Azure. So this just shows that we are absolutely invested in being able to help everyone uh, work with Terraform on Azure and make that a success. That's our commitment to that. Now let's talk a little bit about a roadmap because this always comes up in, in conversation as well. What's coming out and when? So if you go to this public GitHub repo, this is the repo for the Azure RM provider for Terraform, and in it you can very easily see the milestones of the version of the of the provider, when it's targeted to be released, and within that specific milestone, you can see what's coming, right? So new data sources, enhancements to say documentation samples, maybe there's enhancements to existing services because there's a new SKU, a new property, a new element that's been made available in Azure, and so we need to work to update the provider to have that property available natively in the Terraform provider. So as you can see very easily, very publicly, our commitment to this and how we're striving to work hard to fill some of those gaps, uh, you know, fix those bugs and so forth, so that if you are running into a situation where maybe there's a, 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 a new Azure service that's not yet in the Terraform provider, you can come to this and see a rough estimate as to when it might be released. Now, of course, we know dates can change. Obviously, things have changed a lot in the world, but this is our target. And if you notice, it's effectively pretty much every week that we are releasing. So dot, uh, 2.18 is actually due tomorrow. So um, I took these screenshots a couple of days ago because I did this presentation for uh, another uh, pr uh, partner inside Microsoft. So this could be already uh, out the door by now. Perhaps so, so you can see that uh, there's there's definitely constant enhancement to that. Sorry, is there a question, Arlen? Yes, there is, Aiden. Uh, we have a question from Rasto. He's had a question about the previous slide. Uh, Rasto, do you oh, want to come sure. off mute and uh, ask the question? Yeah, sure, sure. Arden, thank you. Um, so my question, Arden, is that um, with uh, with um, the Terraform modules that are out there, um, I know you have to reference it on the code so that it can it's, uh, it can get it working, but just like PowerShell, is it possible to download the, the modules into your machine so that you have a reference for to it in your local machine instead of actually pulling it out to the Terraform registry? So what happens, uh, and we'll maybe touch a little bit on this on the basics slide, but when you do a Terraform init, it will, if you're using a public module from a repo, like you're telling it where the source sits when you're when you're referencing the module and so it will have to go out to that public repo um, and and download it. Now, if you want to work with something that's completely private, like a private repo of modules, you can do that, but I believe that requires uh, Terraform Enterprise, which allows you to have that private module uh, ability. Um, so it's all 
basically encapsulated within, say, your your organization's network, and you don't have to go outside. But the challenge with that would be <clears throat> if you are going to use a module that's normally publicly available, you still have to somehow get that artifact right into Terraform Enterprise unless you're going to write all your own custom modules. But if you're going to repurpose something that's public, you have to be able to somehow obtain that package to be able to inject it into Terraform Enterprise, into the private module repo uh, internally, and then reference it internally. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Uh, any other uh, questions, Arlen? That is all, Aiden. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to talk just a little bit about version 13 of Terraform. Uh, for those that might not be aware, uh, right now we're sitting in version 12, but HashiCorp has released the beta version of dot 13, and there's a few uh, highlights on the enhancements to the language that are really welcomed and I'm excited about. I want to bring to everyone's attention because I hit some of these challenges uh, in a real world public project um, that now with these new features we're actually able to, to utilize. So the first and foremost is the ability to use count, depends on, and for each loops within a module construct itself. So before dot 13, you couldn't uh, reference one module and then have a second module uh, being called and tell it to kind of effectively wait for the first module to be completed. Uh, you couldn't do that. You had to kind of a, have a bit of a, a hacky way around uh, to kind of daisy chain that or kind of put a weight in between. Um, and it wasn't really great. Now that we're getting this depends on ability in a module block is I'm super excited for that because that's going to make life uh, a whole lot easier. Notice in the screenshot on the right, we have a required provider syntax in the Terraform block. So this is something new that's been added where we can say I'm going to use the Azure provider. I'm going to use the AWS or GCP provider. Where is the, the source of that provider? In this case, it's the public reference to HashiCorp uh, specifically, and what version am I locking that to? Uh, we'll talk that about that a little bit in the quick basics review that we'll do. One thing that I'm, I find really interesting and I'm excited about is the custom variable validation. So if we look at the screenshot at the bottom, even though yes, it's an AWS reference, that's okay because Terraform is multi-cloud, even though most of this talk is going to be Azure specific, but we have a variable that we're declaring an, an image ID and standard stuff. It's a string. Here's a description of what we're looking for, but we can build validation into that variable and we can have a condition around that. So if the value that's being passed in as the variable doesn't match this condition, then it's not even going to attempt the execution of our Terraform template and then fail later on down the line, down the pipe, so to speak. We're able to catch that up front and push back to make sure we get the right type of value. So we see in this example, it has to start with AMI dash for the image type in AWS specifically. So that's something really awesome to have to improve the end user experience, especially if you're going to create your own custom modules and release them you know, either publicly or even in a private repo internally. If it's just used internal to your organization, uh, then you can start to build some of that better validation. So as people are calling and leveraging your code, the, you have the input that you're looking for and the output that's going to come out, but you're validating that so that it's a better uh, and more consistent experience uh, to have a successful deployment. So let's cover a little bit of the basics just to kind of level set for those uh, on the on the line. If you haven't catched my or caught my uh, beginner edition of this uh, series, there's a link to the uh, beginner series recording here on the slide. I believe it's also in the chat as well. So feel free to kind of circle back there. It's about an hour and a half, two hours as well, where we actually go effectively line by line into this example uh, Terraform code that you see here and explain all the pieces. So we're just going to assume people have a general understanding of 
the basic commands in Terraform, init, plan, apply, and destroy on, on how you're leveraging the code and working with that. We're assuming that uh, you understand the different pieces like resource types. So we see in the top right uh, example, we're calling an Azure RM provider and we're deploying a resource group for the resource type. Uh, we have a name reference within the Terraform code itself and then the configuration properties of that specific resource. So we're assuming that you, you understand the basics of how that kind of works. Um, obviously properties are different with the different types of uh, resources that you deploy and also the file structure example at the bottom. We have uh, our Terraform block. We have a back end where we're, we're going to control state. We're assuming you understand uh, the importance of state and how that works. Um, version locking right with Terraform, pinning it to a specific version. Same thing with the provider. We're pinning the Azure RM provider to a certain version, passing variables into for client secrets and IDs and subscriptions and so forth. Uh, we're assuming you understand variables where obviously you can kind of pass stuff in. It's kind of common, but then how that's referenced within the code. So we have the storage account that's referencing a property from the resource group. So Terraform understands that it needs to create the resource group first before it can create the storage account because there's that dependency there. I'm going to pause here in case there might might be some questions around some of the basics before we get into the intermediate stuff. I have a question, Annie. Yeah. Sure. So, so one of the things that I've seen is that I can see right there that the commands for uh, Terraform includes init, plan, apply, destroy. Is it possible in the future uh, maybe to have also import? Because you would probably have environments where have been built out like three, four years ago, and you want to actually start using Terraform to actually manage the environment. So, if, yep. so that if you can import the entire uh, infrastructure, yeah, existing, so, uh, existing that, stuff. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so good feedback. Um, generally speaking, uh, I consider import to be a little bit more of an advanced topic, only because uh, if you're if you're familiar with it, which it sounds like you are, right? You have to write your code first. You have to reference resource ID objects specifically and run it against the environment to pull it into the state file. And to me, that's uh, at least on the higher higher or more advanced version of intermediate or I was orig originally thinking of having that as part of the advanced potential version. Yep, but good good point. Thank you. Were there any other questions? I think that's it for now, Aiden. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to keep an eye on the time so I don't uh, go too too far over our time. Sorry, in it, plan, apply, and destroy. All right, let's go beyond some of these basics. Now we're kind of used to uh, writing Terraform code, uh, you know, pulling that stuff together. Now the first thing we're going to talk about are some of the more intermediate commands um, that I feel are important to kind of be aware of. First and foremost is Terraform FMT. So this is a formatting uh, command. And why would you kind of want to use this would be if you're working as a team, for example, you don't want someone to be able to come in and look at the code and say, OK, uh, Joe wrote that, Jane wrote this, Bob wrote that, Mary wrote this because of the styling, right? Ideally, in a team environment, the code that's being produced should be formatted and stylized the same way because it doesn't matter who wrote it. So using uh, Terraform FMT as part of, say, your your GitHub check-in process, um, you know, maybe part of a pipeline uh, process, that type of thing, is something to get into a good habit with, so that there's some consistency around that style and format of the code that's being produced. So it does things like are are the uh, equal sign indented all evenly at the same point and so forth, things like that. Uh, Terraform Graph helps you to visualize your execution plan or your configuration file that you've uh, authored. Um, truthfully, it's not that great of a picture. It's not going to produce this amazingly awesome Visio diagram type of level. It would be really cool if it did, but it doesn't. Uh, it produces a DOT file, which can be piped into, converted into uh, like a, an image file, like a PNG file. Uh, it can get a little difficult to to read and to, to kind of piece together uh, when you're 
you deal with larger environments uh, because it's more just a bunch of boxes and lines showing uh, that graph of all the different dependencies and so forth. Uh, but it is at least something that can can be produced if you needed to leverage that um, to maybe say create a flow diagram or or build something else off of that. Terraform Show uh, is a really great tool to help us to as humans to be able to read uh, from the state file or read the, uh, the the output from that because when you look at the state file there's a, there's a lot of code in there there's a lot of like syntax stuff in there and it can be a little bit difficult especially if you're dealing with like a large complex environment in a single state then terraform show helps us to be able to read that information in a human way if say we needed to reference a specific uh, object id for example Terraform validate is part of a, a process to validate our, our syntax of our code that we've written. Is it consistent? Is it valid? But we're going to actually touch on this a little bit later uh, in some bonus uh, information later. When you do Terraform init, Terraform plan, right? Uh, it triggers this uh, validation mechanism as part of that Terraform plan, but you can also just trigger Terraform validate directly if that's what you wanted to do just to check your code. Finally, we have Terraform taint. It marks a resource as tainted so that forces it to be destroyed the next time you do a Terraform apply and then recreate it. Why would you want to do this? Well, think about uh, a scenario where you have a storage account and you have your, your SAS access keys. Maybe you want to roll those access keys every 30 days, 60 days, every day, whatever. Then by using Terraform taint and targeting that specific object, that specific resource or, or property, then the next time Terraform plan and apply is triggered against that code, it will see that it needs to destroy that and regenerate it. So that's a, a way to be able to use that. Now we're going to talk about alternative or non default providers. So we see in the example in the screenshot on the right where we have our, our default provider. It's our Azure uh, provider, but we have an alternative one underneath. So the default one is referencing uh, Canadian Azure data center and the alternative one is referencing a US one. Notice that the alternative one has an alias reference as well. This came up in our conversation on the first on the beginner edition of uh, of this presentation around being uh, able to use aliases. Why would you want to use this? What's the con? What's the scenario that we, you would actually use this in a real world? Well, see in the example where we're deploying a resource group, but we're targeting the aliased provider. So we're saying we want this resource group deployed in the US specifically where this location is is tagged to for the provider. So think about the scenario where let's say you're building and deploying a hub and spoke network topology. And let's say you're targeting uh, targeting targeting the deployment by geography. So we're going to take Canada because that's where I am and what I'm most familiar with. So Canada Central and Canada East as the Azure data centers. Now you could have your hub and spoke network topology uh, deployed uh, in Canada Central, run that run that Terraform code, and that's stored in one state file. And then you have to change your backend, point to a different state file, and trigger the same deployment to Canada East for another re region. But if you wanted to say deploy both of those simultaneously, so Canada Central and Canada East at the same time contained in the same state file. Here's where you can actually use multiple providers. So both of those are, are contained in the same space. But it does mean that you're going to have some duplicate code because if I want to deploy a VNet in Canada Central and a separate one in Canada East, it doesn't act like a like a loop over the providers, you're targeting a specific one. By default, it's the default provider. There's no alias there. That's what it assumes. But if you want to do two simultaneously, then 
you're going to duplicate a lot of your code. So that's just something to kind of consider depending on your needs, the customer needs, the architecture of the project, and really how you want to manage the state file for what you're deploying. Now we're going to talk about collection uh, collection types. So lists, maps, and sets. So in an example on the right, this is something I've actually used with a real world uh, project, a real world customer. We have a variable and its type is map and we're listing the Azure data centers. So these correspond to the location respective of how Azure views it for the location that you're targeting the deployment in. But then we're mapping it to something else. So we're using this to create, if you look at the example on the bottom, we're using this to create a consistent naming convention based on location of deployment. So I'm deploying this resource group that's holding my production networking uh, resources, but I'm taking the location, which I still need for the resource group, taking that and passing that in to this map variable, which will then return my short name as part of this consistent naming convention for location. So it's kind of like an array. You can get really complicated with these where you have like an array within an array uh, and that kind of gets a little complicated, but it's still possible to do. So think about maps and lists and sets as a really great way to, to have some flexibility and apply things like consistency uh, like we would do uh, in programming languages with arrays. So Aiden, we have a question here uh, sure. from Dipesh. He asks, mm -hmm. can we pass provider and alias as a map to module and avoid dupl duplicacy? Can we pass provider and alias as a map or to, to the map? As map to module and avoid duplicacy. As map to, hmm. so right. Um, you showed in the demo, right? Like when you're creating the resource, you can provide oh. provider value and reference the alias you want to use. Yeah, so I'm wondering if you add alias to all the providers, like for central Canada, central Canada East, mm -hmm. and then pass those right. as map, right? right? And then um, I pray for it. Yeah, interesting. Um, but that would mean that would mean, um, you would have to ensure every single resource you declare has that provider reference, right? Because if if because it's going to assume whatever is default. Now I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head if the Terraform compile will still look for like a default provider, uh, or if it would complain if it didn't have something, or if you can have like a null type of value that would then yeah pass along that's a really awesome awesome question uh please uh make a note of that follow up with me after because i i want to kind of test that that's awesome yeah uh, i i haven't done that myself but that's a really interesting scenario yeah sounds good i'm gonna give thank it as well thanks thank you very much that's awesome okay now we're gonna talk unless there's sorry is there any other questions up till now that's all I've seen on the chat window, but if anyone has any other questions, feel free to come off mute and ask uh, Aiden that during this point. Okay, Aiden, it sounds like we're good. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, no problem. So now let's talk a little bit about loops and condition conditionals. So this is where we get into some more of that kind of logic that we have. Basically, there's three uh, meta arguments or elements to what we can use in Terraform. We can use count, Right, takes a whole number, right? How many instances, how many virtual machines do we want? How many data disks do we want and so forth? For each is that loop, right? Where we're passing in that map uh, of strings and it does something for each instance. And then the for expression is similar, but slightly different over elements. And you can actually, again, combine some of these together to get a little bit more complicated with that like multi-dimensional array uh, type of approach. So we see, uh, in the example at the screenshot on the bottom, this is where we can use these conditionals uh, to control if something is or is not created. So here I'm looking for a variable of number of data disks if in this for the count of this resource. So if that value, that variable is greater than zero, 
then we're going to use that value that's passed to create that number of data disks. If it's not greater than zero, then obviously that's going to be zero and Terraform will actually skip over and not create that resource. So that's where we can put a little bit of logic, say we're creating virtual machines um, and we give people the option to create data disks or how many they can create. Uh, and then also being able to control the code to be a little bit more flexible and dynamic in producing what we need at the time. Next, we're going to talk about life cycle of a resource. This has three arguments as well that control what happens when resources are created or modified. So the first one is create before destroy. This means that let's say we have a resource and it's it's a mission critical system, but we make a modification in our template which requires Terraform to destroy that resource and create a new one to align to that new configuration. Because remember, not all properties within a, a resource object allow an in-place update or in-place upgrade depending on what it is and depending on the resource. So it might have to destroy something in order to create this new resource uh, alignment. But if we have this create before destroy uh, lifecycle block, then Terraform will try to create the new resource first before it destroys the current one. Now, the challenge with this you need to keep in mind is depending on what you're creating, there's requirements for unique naming. So you cannot create something with an identical name. Think about like a storage account that has to be unique in all of Azure or a database server or instance. You need to you know, have some randomization around that, um, an iteration on on like a count, for example, or, or a random string appended or uh, to the name because it can't create it the exact same name before it uh, it's able to delete the existing resource. So it's useful, but keep that in mind from especially from like a naming perspective and that can cause a little bit of a headache um, if, if that's what we want to use in the lifecycle block at all. Then we have prevent destroy. So this will actually be used kind of like a protection of some sensitive infrastructure where if someone's doing a Terraform plan, it will actually produce an error back if that plan will modify or modify to the effect of destroy that resource. So again, if there's a property that is required and that property is not allowed to do an in-place upgrade or update of that value, it needs to delete destroy the object before it creates a new one with that new configuration, this will prevent that. But prevent destroy will not protect the resource if the code block that defines the resource, so say the database resource object in the code itself, if that entire resource block is deleted from the code itself, that will not protect the resource from being destroyed. Third is ignore changes. Really interesting option and attribute here that we can use because we can use it in the context of shared management. So maybe we're just starting to use Terraform, but we're not doing everything in Terraform just yet. So we're telling Terraform these are the attributes that if they don't match what my Terraform code says, it's okay. Don't worry about it. A good example of this is if you're using Terraform to deploy your infrastructure and then maybe you're using Azure policy on top of that. And in Azure policy, maybe you're using the deploy if not exists condition so that Azure policy will force the object back into compliance if they if they stray from that. So it's modifying the properties and configuration of the resource in Azure outside of Terraform's control and knowledge. So a Terraform plan and apply wouldn't work because now this doesn't jive or match up with what it understands to be the real world in the state file. So by using this ignore changes for something like tags is a really good example 
where we maybe have an Azure policy applied to all resource groups and say everything must have these standard sets of tags and these allowed values. If someone deploys something through Terraform and it doesn't have that tag and the policy is triggered and brings that back into compliance, well, now, now we're changing an object outside of Terraform's understanding or control. So really, uh, really nice feature, but kind of keep in mind that now you're kind of branching in two different spaces, right? You're doing Terraform management and then outside of Terraform management. A better solution really would be to uh, ensure or enforce that those tags are applied at the time of creation on the resource as you're executing Terraform itself. But that's not always necessarily uh, possible. OK, I'm going to take a brief, uh, brief uh, uh, break here for a moment, see if there's any questions up until now uh, before we get into some of the reusability aspects. No questions? Nothing in the chat window, uh, Aiden. So if anyone okay. would like to come off mute uh, and ask a question, otherwise, Aiden, you could continue on. OK, very good. No problem. And if there is, again, obviously, do feel free to uh, to interrupt. So now we're going to talk in about and branch into more uh, reusability. So we're writing our Terraform code. OK, maybe we have some loops some logic uh, around that and that's great but really we don't want to reinvent or recode the wheel so this is where we get into topics like modules so a module is uh, effectively that repeatability of that that those blocks of code so a good example or a simple example would be anything inside a specific folder is effectively a module so we see in my uh, middle screenshot, the second screenshot there, I have an express route module that doesn't have any code in the root of that directory. But within there, I have a module for deploying an express route circuit, uh, doing a connection, and then doing a peering. Same thing with the hub and spoke. I have a hub module where I'm deploying my core networking, I'm deploying both an express route and VPN gateway and Azure Firewall, which by the way, all three of those I'm controlling with conditions to say if if a variable of deploy firewall or deploy ER gateway or VPN gateway equals true, then create it, then execute that code. If not, then don't. Same thing with the, the spoke. Um, modules there and also the vnet peering module as well so those are separate um, modules that we call and we're calling the code execution within there so in the top um, screenshot we see we're calling the circuit module we're telling it where it exists so it's local to my system that i'm operating on relative to where i'm calling this code specifically for the circuit deployment i'm passing variables into it that it's expecting. So those modules are expecting uh, a certain variable name on the left and the value I'm passing it is on the right. We'll see that a little bit more uh, in the live example as well as uh, in the next couple of slides as well. Again, I want to iterate that with Terraform version 13 in beta currently, we get this functionality with that depends on and count and for each for the modules, which we did not have up to this point. So we're able to have much more uh, flexibility like we do in our normal code, but at the module level as well. So that's that's something to kind of look at specifically. So Aiden, we have one yeah. uh, another question in the chat window if you want to check it out. Uh, oh, two sorry. questions. Do you want me to come off the presentation and read it? Is it long? Um, actually, no, it isn't. Um, I can just read it out to you quickly here. Uh, most of the modules can be referenced or important to the um, to the init. Uh, that's what he's asking. I think it's just a question. That makes most sense. Of, most of the modules can be Im imported to the init. When you do a Terraform init, it will go and read uh, 
not only your Terraform configuration and your provider configuration, but also if you're referencing any modules, it will go and read what that module depends on as well uh, as part of the initialization. Does that answer the question? If you, uh, if the person who asked the question would like to come off mute and, and ask anything further about that, otherwise we'll move on. Sorry, is there a second question though? I, I thought, know. Just, I the other one enough. was, the other one was, um, actually there was, so change the config as needed, question mark. Uh, change which config? That's a good question. It's a very short question. <laughs> so okay. yeah, if if who, whoever has those few questions, if you can either elaborate on that for us, um, that might help me uh, uh, answer that for you. Uh, it's like a resources, like when you try to use the resources yep. and you have all of these configuration files mm -hmm. and then do you declare it at the init or just uh, go along with the resource? is I'm gonna, how I'm trying to put it. Uh, like declare what though, sorry. Maybe that's the part that I'm not following. Resources. So um, when you do it, like in the, re for, for resources, you write that in your Terraform template files, which we'll, I'll show you in a moment. You, you declare and say resource as a resource group. And yes. Around that. Um, yes. When you do a Terraform it init, um, it doesn't create them at that point. It will initialize on what does it need from a Terraform perspective or from a dependency perspective before it, it's ready to kind of do the plan and apply. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> it, 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 sorry, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, we Thank might you. see some of that like live when we go through the example as well. Um, but yeah, if something else comes up along that lines, just feel free to to elaborate that. Uh, did the second question was that um, answered or elaborated on? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> and Aiden, uh, for uh, a person actually <laughs> asked about um, missing the original presentation, so I just pasted oh. in the chat window sure. the links to the presentation and the video recording and additional resources from the, your first presentation. And it's on the Meetup oh, okay. page for the first presentation as well as a description of the second presentation on Meetup. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Aiden. You. Appreciate that. Okay, so let's move on uh, to some more reusability aspects. Um, we're creating resources and that's great, but now we want to, and we're creating modules because that's the right thing to do, but now we want to kind of stitch stuff together. So a good example of this is this, this example screenshot that I have here. I have the VNet peering that I want to create. So the peering itself is its own module. And we'll see in the in the code example uh, to do a VNet pairing, you need uh, the VNet ID of both the the source and the target VNets to peer together on both sides. But if we're calling this peering module, the declaration or the creation of the you know shared the hub and the spoke VNets is not part of this code, so it has no way to understand. Uh, that already exist, and we don't want to hard code necessarily uh, the values in. We want to make it um, dynamic as much as possible. So in here, we use something called a data source, which tells Terraform, go and look up this object from the state file. So it's a virtual network in Azure. It is, this is the, the, the name and the resource group, because you need a filter to be able to find the right object specifically. Go look up this resource so that I can use that reference point, that data point for some other property that I haven't created as part of this module. So this comes really uh, in handy, uh, especially when you're doing a separation of uh, responsibilities of code. So say you have a networking team that's responsible for obviously all the networking code and an app team that's trying to deploy into an existing network. Well, the networking team isn't going to let the app team directly look at and modify the networking code, but they can reference something that's existing which we'll touch on in a moment as well, which is this slide, remote state. So maybe uh, we're not passing in um, 
the data source of an existing object for Terraform, they'll look it up. There's another way we can do it using remote state, provided obviously it's it's kept in a space uh, that's accessible. But the networking team could say, OK, our back end holding our state for our networking code is here. Here's the workspace. Like in this case, this is a, a Terraform cloud configuration remote state. Here's what you you need to pop populate in your template code. And then later on, they can use that data reference, referencing the remote state and the output that comes from that, the subnet ID in this case, that they want the virtual machine deployed into. They don't need to know um, all the other bits and pieces around that. They can just reference that state uh, directly in a central kind of way. So this is also really good when there's that delineation or separation of state and responsibility from uh, an enterprise or a team perspective. But the important piece to call out here is that last bullet that if we want to be able to reference an attribute, it has to be an output from the module. So it an output is uh, part of the basic uh, presentation, but that is how we get the values that are generated as part of the actual execution of the plan. Those resource IDs, the GUIDs, whatever else were, that is created for us, we need those values for some other activity or action. We need to surface those as outputs so that that output is what's stored in the state file that can be referenced in this context. Okay, here's some bonus material. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there is a linter called TF Lint. It's part of the GitHub Super Linter package or action. You can, uh, it has a lot of really good stuff in there, but it's used to validate against specifically provider issues. So remember we talked about Terraform validate being part of that trigger for Terraform init and plan and so forth, and you can call that directly. If you watch, take a minute, let's watch the little kind of graphic uh, uh, image going around here you'll notice he creates a file it has the wrong instance type but terraform validate says hey the terraform code looks right there's no issue tf lint actually validates against the provider itself you'll see the apply will now fail because that's not a proper instance in this case for aws but when, when he runs tf lint you'll be able to see that it right away tells you immediately that there's something wrong because the value that you're passing for this is not valid for the provider. So think about using this as part of a gate from a, a check-in process uh, for your GitHub repo from like a pipeline perspective as well. So that pipelines aren't even triggered for deploy without passing not only Terraform validate from a code perspective, but from a TF lint perspective from the provider being targeted that it will succeed because the values are correct and and um, are well basically are correct right that way you're not going to have partial deployments uh, that partially succeed partially fail now what's cool about this is it's actually available for all major clouds so we have Azure AWS and Google now there's a bunch of rules in here that it validates against AWS has the most currently 700 plus rules because that's the first one they started with. They're currently working on the Azure rules. So notice it has experimental support as they're kind of iterating and improving that. We have just under 300 rules there and Google GCP has one. So that's definitely a work in progress right now as they iterate on this, but really awesome tool to include as part of your DevOps process or even just as a team process without even thinking about DevOps. This helps as a validation check before you go and execute your code. And it's free. OK, so let's stop talking and let's uh, start watching. Let's actually do this. So let me know, Arlen, uh, that so we can see the screen. You can see the VS code. It's perfect. Yes, Aiden. Excellent. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so first and foremost, I'm going to show you the code for the hub network. So it's kind of standard 
stuff, right? We have a resource group. We've got uh, NSGs specifically. We have rules configured in those NSGs. Uh, later on down here, we've got things like subnets and associations of those NSGs and so forth. Standard kind of stuff. It's passing in certain variables. It's doing its thing. It's uh, not overly exciting or complicated. Same thing with the spoke. Um, uh, modules as well, same type of approach. Now in the VNet peering, we have um, the 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 peering code only. So we see that it needs the remote VNet ID. So in this case, we're going hub to prod. So we're saying we're taking the hub network and we need the ID of the prod network to be able to do that peer on the one end and then reverse because that's how vnet peering works it has to be configured on both sides then we need to take the the production virtual network and get the hub network id to finish the peering now if you if you're familiar with vnet peering in azure these two code blocks cannot be triggered simultaneously because they stumble over each other you need the one side to finish first and then the next side because it's modifying elements underneath from the VNet perspective. So it's like a race condition. So we have a depends on here within the code saying this block, this peering resource object depends on this first object. So it needs to wait for this to be done before it can trigger the peering on the second piece. So that's kind of how you can daisy chain that all together through hub and spoke and hub to non-prod, hub to prod, even prod to prod across uh, regions and so forth. It can get a little complicated, um, but that's where we can use that depends on feature. So we're so not- So Aiden, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, I'm sure everyone is looking at this code and having code envy. Do you know where, or will you be sharing where <laughs> they can find finding this? Because this is a great foundation to start with, to experiment, to learn with. Is this something that can be made available or will you share where, where to find it? Uh, Yes, there there should be a version of this in one of my GitHub repos. Um, I forget which one it's in because I have a lot, but I will I'll find out which one I put it in uh, and then we could share that out after. Yeah, great. I mean, what I'd suggest is maybe adding it as a, another slide or some of the other content you have there. Sure. And, then and that way, when we share the PowerPoint out as part of the content, um, they'll find it more easily. Have it. To, okay. Okay. Good, uh, good idea. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Aiden. Yeah. No problem. So now we're going to look at, so all these things down here are my modules of code, but I'm actually going to control the deployment through its own separate deployment module so that I can iterate on this actual code itself here, but then control the, the deployment of it separately. So here we have the provider that we're triggering. We are version locking it to the right one. Same thing with Terraform. I have my backend stuff um, commented out just to make it easier for demo purposes. Uh, so it's just going to use the local state. But if I maybe make this a little bit smaller for everyone, uh, we can see here's my module for shared services. I'm calling this hub directory. So it's literally going up. It's traversing the file folder hierarchy all the way up because I have lots of folder directories up to here and then back down into here all the way down here. So this is relative to where this deployment file is sitting on where it needs to point to. Passing variables, all that other fun good stuff uh, like that. So basically let's make this a little bit bigger. I'm in the hub deploy. Well, and now that's having some fun on the screen. For a minute. It's going to make that a little bit bigger. So uh, par part of our conversation there is with Terraform init, right? You see it initializes the modules because from this code, it sees I'm referencing this module. It needs to go into the module to understand maybe that needs some other reference or some other uh, element two that it needs to download. It initializes the back end. This is the local one. Any plugins around that and we're green and good. So now if we go Terraform plan. And I'm going to use a file. That I'll show you in a moment. East US TF of ours. 
Oops. And we're going to go out and we're going to go hub east uh, plan. Hopefully I typed that right. Give that a moment to do its thing. I just want to make sure it starts the process or if I uh, typed it wrong. So while that thinks, so I have this code. I want to deploy this hub in the east and the west US. OK, fair enough. If I look at my variables, these are the values that I'm passing through into this uh, creation as it's spinning this spinning this out. Um, so notice here it's saying, OK, all the green pluses. This is what I'm going to create. I'm going to create 17 objects. Nothing being changed. Uh, I'm getting a warning for using a deprecated uh, object or property. That's OK. It's still going to work. So I'm going to kick this off. Terraform apply and I'm going to call hub east dot plan. So my plan file, I'm going to go auto approve. So that it doesn't whoops. Maybe it doesn't uh, like. Maybe my screen is uh, looking kind of weird. Configuration path expected. Oh, did I? Maybe it's double dash for auto proof. OK, we'll see if that comes back to prompt me for this. Um, anyways, so I want to execute this hub in two different regions so I can have a separate TF vars file available with the appropriate properties for the region I'm targeting. And that way I'm going to execute the exact same code, but obviously like the uh, Vena address space is going to be different. Um, we're going to use like a different location reference. Obviously, maybe I do or don't want to uh, enable um, the gateways, which I'm not because they take 30 minutes to deploy. So that's uh, not uh, fun to just sit there and watch. But basically, again, repeatability, right? And we see how it's executing here against my subscription. It's like this is being created. This is done being created as it goes through and calls all the code within the hub. If we go into the portal and do a refresh is it not quite done yet still creating almost done so we see as that's going we have our our resource group we have tags on the resource group just like we've uh, specified and it's creating all of these objects uh, in here specifically per the code okay done great woohoo now we want to go and deploy uh, the uh, spoke because we want to do this spoke. So we're going to change directories and take caps lock off. And we're going to go into spoke deploy. So same thing. Now I just have one location in this case, so it's it's fine as is. But again, you can have multiple, so you can say these are the exact values I want to use for resources in this specific region. So we're going to go Terraform init as well, because it's a new space. So notice it's initializing the non-prod and prod modules. So I'm I'm creating two spokes out of this. Download to the Azure RM plugin or uh, provider rather. Terraform plan of our file equals and spoke if I can type. Bars out. I mean, okay, spoke dot plan. <coughs> So we see here because we're using the local state, it has the state lock. We have the state file here. So when it's done creating, we can look at the hub one. You'll actually see all the actual values that are returned from Azure once that resource is created. So we'll see the GUIDs and, and the other uh, elements referencing there. So I want to just kick this off real quick. And it's creating 28 resources. Apply and then we're going to say spoke.plan. I'll just make sure that starts rolling. 
And once that starts rolling, um, then I'm going to show you the code for the peering deploy and we'll kind of focus on that data source again as well just to see how that works. All right, so that's kicking off. I'll just minimize this a little bit. We go over to our peer. Here is where we have that data again, right? So we're saying I need this information from these re uh, virtual networks or these resources in this case because I need to reference a property, but I am not creating them as part of this specific hub. So in the code, we are referencing not only passing variables in specifically again, but also abstracting or obtaining that network ID, the resource ID for that specific network. We're not saying in here, this is the ID of that object. It's saying this is the filter, go find this object for me so I can reference any other property about it. OK, so that's been created, so we are going to just go and take a quick look in the portal again, make sure it's showing up. OK, we have prod, non prod and our shared services just to you know, see there's nothing up my sleeve. We're going to go into the virtual network. We see we've got subnets, we've got NSGs associated there, but we do not yet have any pairings, zero pairings. Let's go back to the code. Peering, do the exact same thing. There for a minute. Does the same thing, right? Checks the modules because now we're calling different bits and pieces again. Terraform plan. Whoops. Or file equals peering dot tf vars. Note. Okay, let that kick off. Uh, something to keep in mind when you're using TF vars files, which I like to do because then we're able to, again, very easily as part of our code and the code as documentation, say these are the exact values that were used as part of this execution, and, and we can refer back to them at any point in time. Um, you can use what's called an auto dot tf vars file which terraform will automatically pick in pick up in that directory but i still like to name them explicitly especially if we're in like the hub and spoke perspective we are um, executing against different environments it's just cleaner from a human standpoint from an organization standpoint to label it oh this is the hub for canada central for example terraform apply and we'll go Peering dot plan. So we see here, notice if we take a look at the plan for this, it's already obtained. Here's that ID of that object that I need from looking up that data resource specifically to pass into the execution. Same thing with this one being the shared services of the hub and the spoke. So now that's kicking off. I'm going to make sure I'm not sitting on here just in case it causes any slight issue. While we're waiting for this momentarily, so you'll see as it's executing, remember we did that daisy chain that depends on for the module. So we're doing the hub to P, uh, prod first and then prod to hub. You'll see it's going to wait. It's waiting for that to be done before it triggers that other module, uh, even though it's all part of the same code. So while we're waiting that for that to kind of finish, is there any other questions in the chat that I haven't been able to see or answer yet? Everything looks good, Aiden. And awesome. uh, if anyone wants to come off mute and ask any questions, this is the time. Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Oh, Rasta yep. has a question. Sure. I have a question. This is Rasta. Um, uh, Aiden, so when you're, um, let's say you do deploy your code in one data center, uh, let's say a VM with a SKU of, let's say, D series or F series. Yep. Then you change and you want to deploy the same, same resource in a different region. Okay. And then that region doesn't doesn't have the SKU that you already deployed in the other uh, region. Yep. Where do you see the error? Do you see it during the plan or is it during the apply? You will see the error during the apply because Terraform plan 
only validates the the terraform code itself and the values it's expecting so for variables and making sure that's um at least passing a variable or a value or it's a string so it's looking for a string that type of thing terraform does not understand or know the limitations of where you're targeting that's where that tf lint product uh, will come in, though I don't know off the top of my head if it validates SKUs against region specifics. That's a, another really awesome question, so please uh, uh, follow up with me afterwards uh, on that because I want to dig into that too, so that's that's a really good scenario. Thank you. So when you hit, when you would go Terraform apply, it would, tr Terraform would go and try to execute, and then because it's just calling the APIs from Azure in this case, right? Uh, then the APIs, APIs would return that error and then Terraform would come back and error out. Okay, so this is executed. David, yep. Just a quick reminder, we have about 30 minutes left and yep. if you wanna leave some time as well for questions, this yep. is a time check, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, appreciate it. So here's our shared services VNet and then we go look in the pairings, nothing up my sleeve, ta-da. Now we have the peerings all working and connected. If we had only done it the one side, hub to prod, this would not say connected yet. You'd have to finish from prod to hub to allow this to uh, become in a peering state. So nothing up my sleeve and it's, well, I won't say it's magic, it's code. Okay, so that's kind of how all those bits and pieces kind of come together. So let's kind of quick go back to this so that we have enough time for uh, questions. If I can get this to resume, there we go. You can uh, see the slide still. Perfect. Thanks, Aiden. Excellent. Okay, so now we've talked about code reusability. We've seen it in action and how that kind of works, and that's good because that's the state that we kind of want to work towards. Eventually, though, how do we? What's the next step? Right? Where do we go from here? Now we get into like. DevOps pieces, right? It's it's related to it currently right now, but we still haven't talked too much about that. So we're not going to go into a lot of depth here. That's what the advanced presentation next week will be about. So as a bit of a sneak peek, um, next week I will go through uh, Terraform Advanced, where we will deploy a hub and spoke topology, just like we did with the peering, but we're going to use both uh, both Azure DevOps and the DevOps pipelines. GitHub and GitHub Actions and Terraform Cloud. So we're going to compare all three of those um, DevOps tooling and processes deploying the exact same code to see the pros and cons and how it all kind of comes together. So definitely sign up for the advanced one that's happening uh, next week, uh, just half an hour later, so 6 p.m. Eastern time. So when we talk about DevOps, though, we need to talk about workspaces in the context of Terraform. Now this specific topic is a little confusing because there's two different types of workspaces. There's workspaces in reference to the Terraform CLI where I was typing Terraform init and apply and plan in that context and there's Terraform workspaces in Terraform cloud which we'll cover on the next slide. Uh, so there's a difference and it can be a little bit confusing uh, depending on the documentation if it's clear on which one it's referring to. But a good example of using this from the CLI or the command line interface is you saw how I was deploying that hub in say Canada Central or in the East US in that con concept or context. Now if I wanted to deploy that hub in West US I would have to reference, I would have to make a separate state file, right? We talked about this, where we could have a, a provider, a default provider and an alias provider. So same kind of thing. You can have a workspace on the from the command line, execute the one Terraform apply for East US hub, change the workspace from the command line to a new one, execute the exact same code, not moving directories, execute the same code for East US or West US, whatever the opposite one or whatever I just said, uh, and it would create a separate state file that's not interfering with the other one. So it's a separation aspect. It's really good. 
from say region to region if you're not going to deploy those simultaneously with multiple providers uh, and that kind of context context but you need to also remember then as a team okay i need to switch to this workspace i need to switch to this workspace before you execute your terraform a plan and apply um there's examples here. I'm not going to read the slide because I don't like it when people are just read slides. But the other examples are if you're like separating, say, networking from production or, you know, the networking prod versus networking dev, for example. Lots of flexibility, uh, but it's all about reusing the exact same code, but you're just forking or, or you have a separation of state files specifically. So with that, let's talk a little bit about Terraform Cloud. So this is HashiCorp's product that allows you to have a remote backend for shared state. So when you work as a team, you can target this so that I'm working on my laptop, I come home, I want to work on my desktop, or you know, another person on the team uh, is new on the team. Uh, they point to the same state file, the same workspace from the Terraform Cloud perspective, and we're able to uh, do our Terraform plan and execute against the same state file so there's no conflicts or anything like that. This is also one of those things that I get into the advanced version next week where I do a Terraform execution, pipeline execution using Terraform Cloud. So we'll see this in much more detail and depth uh, next week, so I'm not going to touch on it uh, too much more. <clears throat> okay, so now um, we, we've kind of gone through a lot of the meat in the presentation. I want to provide everyone with some intermediate level resources for learning stuff because we all need to learn and uh, and progress and we need to learn from each other. So again, if you attended my beginner series presentation, these resources, with the exception of one or two, uh, are not the same as the beginner one, so it's not cut and paste if you were on that first one. The first one that is because my my personal curated list of Terraform learning resources that I've used when I started learning Terraform covers the spectrum of basics, intermediates and advanced topics anyways. So definitely hit that up. That Those are the resources I personally used that I found most effective out of the plethora of articles and blogs and videos and courses and books. For those that know me personally, because I know there's a few people on the call that I, I recognize their names personally. Uh, everybody that knows me knows that I read quite a lot. So instead of you trying to figure out, OK, what is the right or the best resource to get started? Definitely hit up my list um, and even ask me for personal advice. We have examples, uh, articles on optimizing our code, some more advanced techniques around there. Um, the the middle one about how we organize our projects and modules really good because how granular do you get into making modules and sub modules you can get really really crazy but is that the most efficient or effective way where do you kind of draw that line right we talked about reusability with modules to understand how that works we talked about that those conditional stuff and the loops to be able to use that what are the challenges with that uh, as well as some book resources. Uh, like the beginner edition of this presentation, I am referencing the Visual Studio Code extensions to help you in your Terraform template creation. So the Azure Terraform uh, extension by Microsoft and the Terraform one originally by Mikhail, but is now owned by HashiCorp. And they've just released not too long ago, uh, HashiCorp's first release of that extension since they took it over and it has some really nice um, IntelliSense uh, and code completion in there for you. I've actually written a blog article about it as soon as it came out because I wanted to get a feel to see how they enhanced it. There's still some stuff they need to add to it. They've publicly mentioned that, which is fine, but I'm excited to see where it's going because they've now integrated their new language engine into the extension to help with that IntelliSense and code completion and validation. So definitely take a look at that. One more page of resources for everyone because you can't fit them all on one page. There's too much on the internet, but things about how to use workspaces because that's going to be important from delineation of code for different teams, different environments and so forth. There's a hands on lab available in building modules so you get 
comfortable with that repeatability, how you can kind of architect that, what you need to think about, uh, what you want as an input to a module, what you want to send back out as an output for a value that needs to be used possibly somewhere else, like in a resource ID or object ID. We at Microsoft have a, a list, a ton of Azure Terraform quick start templates. So if you're familiar with Azure and we have the Azure quick start template uh, repo or site, we have the same thing, but for Terraform templates. So definitely take a look at that. Misadventures in Terraform, really actually a great video to take a look at because this is a great way to learn from people's challenges and mistakes. And it's, it's an individual that talks about how they got into some difficult situations with that so that you can learn about that before you hit that. And then you can hopefully plan and architect around uh, those type of scenarios if that's what you're going to leverage it for. I'm not going to list like all of this stuff. One thing I also want to call out is that very last one, uh, Terra Goat. It's something I've recently uh, become aware of. It's a vulnerable by design training project for Terraform. So it deploys some vulnerable resources using Terraform code and allows you to learn how to identify that, how to correct that in authoring Terraform. Now, originally it was only available for AWS and they started to work on Azure, uh, the Azure version of that and eventually GCP. They have since released the Azure version, and I can personally and proudly state that I actually personally had a hand in helping them author the Terraform templates for that training project. So definitely go take a look at that. It's free and it's a great learning opportunity. Finally, everyone always asks about certification because HashiCorp has released that Terraform Associate certification. Uh, if you're not aware of that, um, that is now out uh, of beta, it's now public. Myself personally, as well as uh, another uh, MVP, we personally uh, co-authored a preparation guide for this exam based on our actual real world hands-on experience with Terraform. We wrote this guide before HashiCorp released their official um, study guides and exam review material, but we've also actually had HashiCorp review the publication and unofficially uh, support it. Uh, they can't officially support it because they have their own official uh, resources, but they have actually reviewed um, our progress on that and accepted that as a, a valid resource for preparation on the uh, certification. So definitely uh, take a look at that as well as the official um, resources from HashiCorp to kind of help you go through there uh, with some sample questions, uh, some study guides based on the uh, uh, exam objective uh, list there. So with that, this is my final slide. I have finally talked uh, enough. Uh, this is who I am. This is what I do. It's a lot on this page, uh, but do feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, hit up my blog. I will. I do have articles on my blog about my real world experience with Terraform, and it's not all positive, right? I write about the challenges I've hit, some of the limitations there are. So it is real world. It's not just uh, kind of marketing, so to speak. Um, I do a lot of different stuff. Uh, at Azure, uh, it, I'm sorry, at Microsoft in Azure, I specialize mostly in the infrastructure management, governance, BCDR spaces, as well of, of course, as infrastructure's code and uh, Terraform being a part of that. Before I joined Microsoft, I was a five-time uh, Microsoft MVP, and I am actually happy and proud to announce that HashiCorp has recognized me as what they call a HashiCorp ambassador, which is effectively their version of the MVP program. So with that, I'm going to stop talking momentarily to see if there's any uh, questions or I don't know, is there any wrap up slides that uh, Ezekiel or Arlen have as, as part of it today? Hello, Aiden. Sorry about that. That's OK. <clears throat> yes, I was just making an adjustment to my headset. <laughs> So thank you for this fantastic presentation. And uh, for everyone who may have seen that chat uh, a little while ago, um, uh, Aiden will add another slide with some additional uh, great code that he used for his examples, which is um, it's a good way to get started where you know sometimes you find uh, some of the code out there 
overwhelming. So this is a nice set of code uh, that goes through some basic concepts in Azure uh, and Terraform, and it's a great starting point. And I think you'd find it um, a great way to learn and continue with your uh, path along Azure and Terraform. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you everyone for joining from all around the world. And Aiden, I'll give you the last word before we uh, wrap up. And of course, um, at this point, if you have any questions, please come off mute and please ask Aiden. Otherwise, we will wrap up and give Aiden the last word before we say goodbye. Uh, yeah, thanks, Arlen. So just a reminder for everyone, like this was the intermediate uh, version. We do have the recording of the, you can hear me, right? It just sounds muffled yes. in, my, in my ears. Yes, I can. Um, we have the recording of the beginner. A series. If you're if you're completely new to Terraform and need to understand some of the the basics of the language, that's there. And next week we have the advanced version where it's all about the DevOps uh, processes, deploying the same type of code that we have, hub and spoke, but through the different pipeline mechanisms to see how that works in a in a kind of CI/CD process. So definitely hit that up on the uh, meetup. Uh, page and register for that one if you want to to take a look at that next Wednesday, 30 minutes later than today's start. Well said, Aiden. I have nothing to add to that. You covered all the points, including the um, final presentation, part three, next week. So you covered all the points I wanted to remind everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Aiden, for the second presentation and giving your time to the community to help everyone learn about Terraform and Azure. Um, so let's one last call for anyone or any uh, group of people who have questions. Please go ahead and ask. Otherwise, um, we will have our goodbyes. Um, please come off mute and ask any questions you may have. Yeah. Were there any questions in the chat that weren't uh, answered just yet? No, we covered them all. There's nothing here. Okay. There's a lot of thank yous here, and uh, so it's good. Um, but uh, there's no additional questions at this time. Okay, it does not sound like we have any additional questions at this time. So again, thank you so much, Aiden, and thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, expect a, a notification through the Meetup page as well as other uh, references that um, once the content, the video and the PowerPoint slide is available, uh, it'll be shared out so you can actually watch it again and again and, uh, and uh, share it with your colleagues and friends. Um, it's a great way to learn Terraform and Azure. So thank you all very much. Have a great uh, morning, night or evening or uh, where you are in the world right now. I've seen people from all around the world. Some I, I know from all around the world too. So it's great. And uh, Aiden, you have a global audience. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, no and, problem. I uh, don't mind staying on even for a few minutes if there are other questions, even say after the recording is stopped and so forth. Not a problem. Uh, just a lot of thank yous, uh, but no new questions. And um, perfect. Yeah, that's it. So uh, thank you all very much. I will stop the recording right now. And Aiden, any last words? Uh, hopefully, I am I'm able to see everybody uh, next Wednesday for the the final advanced version. Great. Well, I'll be I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> so will I. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to it. So definitely uh, get connected. Sign up for that on the on the meetup page, uh, so that we can make sure that happens for everyone. Awesome. Thank you, and goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.